Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Mark Redwine? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, consider supporting me on Patreon, and check out my podcast on YouTube, Bella Grande Media. I will put the relevant links for those items in the description for this video. So first I'll start with the background, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Mark and Elaine Redwine married in 1989. They had two sons, Corey and Dylan. The family lived in Durango, Colorado. In 2007, Mark and Elaine divorced. For many years, they were engaged in an acrimonious custody dispute. Elaine managed to get full custody of her two sons and moved to Colorado Springs, but Mark still had visitation rights. Throughout 2012, Multiple witnesses said that Dylan didn't want to visit Mark anymore. Corey was technically an adult by this time, so he didn't have to visit Mark, but Dylan was trapped. During one visit, Mark and Dylan did not appear to be getting along well at all. They were arguing. For the next court-ordered visit, Dylan asked to stay with a friend rather than with his father, but Mark would not permit it. On November 18, 2012, Dylan boarded a flight to Durango, Colorado, to visit his father. At this time, when he boarded the plane, Dylan was uninjured. He was doing well. After arriving, Mark picked up Dylan. They stopped at a Walmart and a McDonald's restaurant before heading to Mark's house. Surveillance video from the airport and from the Walmart indicated that the two didn't really seem to be interacting too much with each other. Dylan had plans to visit his friend's house at 6.30 a.m., on November 19. There's the sense that he really couldn't wait to get away from his father, so he wanted to start the day as early as possible. The last activity from his phone was at 9.37 p.m. on November 18. On November 19 at 2 a.m., Mark's neighbor noticed that the front porch light of Mark's house was on. Later that morning, she saw that the light was off, even though it was still dark outside, suggesting there was some activity involving Mark's house, like somebody coming or going late at night or early in the morning. At 6.46 a.m., the friend who Dylan was supposed to visit sent him a text which read, Where are you? The friend did not get a response from Dylan. Dylan was reported missing that same day, and a search was initiated. Mark told investigators that Dylan was asleep when he woke up that morning. He saw him in the house. Mark left to run errands. Upon his return, he realized that Dylan was gone. Investigators spoke with Mark Redwine's ex-wife, Betsy Horvath. She told them that Mark could have harmed Dylan. He had once talked about how, if he ever had to get rid of a body, he would leave it in the mountains. During their divorce, there was a custody disagreement that was very heated. Betsy and her sister heard Mark say that he would kill the kids before he ever let her have them. Investigators felt this was particularly relevant as Mark and Elaine Redwine had such a bitter divorce, and Mark was not happy with the custody arrangement. Mark tried to explain how Dylan could have become upset and then maybe left the house by saying that Dylan saw a contempt of court accusation on the kitchen table. Mark had left it in plain view. Investigators found another explanation for why Dylan may have been upset. In 2011, Corey and Dylan were with their father on a trip. They were in a hotel room when they found photographs on Mark's computer. Mark was sleeping, so the boys had time to take a good look at these different images. Evidently, the photographs were of Mark dressed up in women's lingerie and consuming what appeared to be feces from a diaper. Sometime later, Dylan would ask Corey to send him those images so he could use them to confront his father. Corey told Mark that he did send those images to Dylan. Two friends of Elaine Redwine were arguing with Mark in front of his house not long after Dylan's disappearance. One of them brought up the topic of the photographs. She insulted Mark using expletives. She kind of wove in the behavior he was engaged in in those photographs. Mark grabbed a log, raised it over his head, and approached the friends. They climbed in a vehicle and drove away, concerned over the possibility that they would be the victims of a log-assisted attack. In June of 2013, a cadaver dog found some of Dylan's remains near Middle Mountain Road 
on an ATV trail. This was about eight miles from Mark's house. Mark owned an ATV and was familiar with the trail. He was actually seen driving an ATV on that trail a few days before a search party was planning on looking for Dylan. Investigators searching Mark Redwine's house found blood in several locations in the living room, including the couch, the floor in front of the couch, the corner of the coffee table, the floor underneath the rug, and on a love seat. The blood on the love seat was identified as belonging to Dylan. He could not be ruled out as a contributor to the rest of the blood that was found. Mark told investigators that his home was recently remodeled. Dylan had not visited many times after that occurred, and Dylan had not sustained any injury that would have caused bleeding. This is different than what Mark's girlfriend said. I'll talk about that in a moment. Toward the end of June, not long after the remains were discovered, Dylan Redwine's half-brother Brandon Redwine told investigators about a bizarre conversation with Mark. Brandon said that Mark talked about blunt force trauma several times and indicated that investigators would have to find the rest of Dylan's body, including the skull, before they could determine what the cause of death was. On August 5, 2013, police dogs detected the presence of a cadaver scent in a number of places, including Mark Redwine's living room and washing machine, clothing he was wearing on the night of November 18, and inside the cab and on the bed of Mark's Dodge pickup truck. On November 1, 2015, which is almost three years after Dylan's disappearance, hikers who were walking on a different area of Middle Mountain Road found a human skull. It belonged to Dylan. This was about a mile and a half away from where his other remains were located. An examination of the skull revealed injuries consistent with blunt force trauma. The damage appeared to be caused by a knife or some other type of tool, not by an animal or other natural cause. Mark Redwine was indicted on charges of second-degree murder and child abuse in July of 2017. He was arrested in Washington. A number of delays occurred in the court proceedings. At one point, his trial was postponed after his attorney was arrested on assault and domestic violence charges. So I guess his attorney was considering experiencing both sides of the criminal justice system, probably just his research to be a better attorney. At another point, the trial was delayed by the COVID-19 pandemic. A mistrial was declared in November of 2020. In July of 2021, Mark Redwine was found guilty on both counts. At the time making this video, he has not yet been sentenced. He's facing up to 48 years in prison for the murder charge and 24 years for the other charge. So 72 years altogether. Now moving to my analysis. Was Mark Redwine actually guilty? Let's look at the factors both for and against the idea of guilt, starting with the inculpatory evidence. It seems unusual that Mark Redwine would run errands and not return on the morning that Dylan disappeared until 11.30 a.m. He had agreed to drive Dylan to a friend's house at 6.30 a.m. There was no indication that there was some change of plan. In addition, he said he took a nap after coming home. He did not start looking for Dylan until 2.30 or 3 p.m. Dylan's blood was found in Mark Redwine's house. It was clear that Dylan was murdered based on the condition of his skull. His remains were found in an area that Mark was familiar with, and Mark and Dylan were not getting along well for a number of reasons, including the embarrassing images. Now moving to the exculpatory evidence. Even though the dogs detected a cadaver scent on Mark's clothes, no blood was found on him. The defense suggested that a wild animal, like a bear, may have been responsible for Dylan's death. I guess it could have been one of those notorious bears who break into houses without causing damage, kill people with blunt objects, attempt to clean up the crime scene, then dispose of the bodies. These assassin bears can be differentiated from normal bears because they're carrying around bleach. No murder weapon was recovered. Mark's girlfriend said that Dylan cut his finger about a year before he disappeared, which explains the blood in the house. This is, of course, a bit different than when Mark Redwine said. He made it sound like Dylan's blood should not have been in the house because of that remodeling that occurred. Only the blood found on the love seat could be definitively identified as Dylan's. A friend who Dylan wanted to visit lived six miles away. It's possible that Dylan decided to walk and something happened to him on the way. A mail carrier spotted two boys at 1.30 p.m. on November 19. One matched a description of Dylan. 
This reminds me of the Scott Peterson case. It was a mail carrier who saw something exculpatory, something that made it seem as though Lacey Peterson, who Scott Peterson was convicted of murdering, was still alive when, under the police timeline, she should have already been killed. When considering all the evidence, do I think that Mark Redwine was actually guilty, like guilty in reality? I think he was. Was he guilty beyond a reasonable doubt? I think he was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt as well. There was some doubt in this case, but it did not reach the level of reasonable. Moving to the next question, what about Mark's appearance on the Phil McGraw show? Mark appeared on the Phil McGraw show along with Elaine and Corey Redwine. This was before Dylan's remains were discovered. Considering that Mark was a suspect in a homicide, this was not a smart move for Mark, although he didn't seem to make any critical errors during his time on the show. Mark did not appear to be particularly sad on the show. He mostly appeared defensive and irritating. He deflected concerns about his behavior and tried to shift responsibility to Elaine and Corey. For example, when they accused him of not being concerned enough to search for Dylan, Mark accused them of obstructing his efforts to search. He also told Elaine that she forgot to supply Dylan with a jacket. It seemed clear that Mark and Elaine had an acrimonious relationship. In one segment, Mark said something to the effect of, we are all suspects in this case. I find this interesting because he was the only suspect as far as I know. And even if he wasn't, I'm not aware of any evidence demonstrating that Elaine or Corey were ever suspects. They were in Colorado Springs, nowhere near Durango, Colorado. Mark was alone with Dylan on the day Dylan disappeared. Mark was responsible for him. Mark is the one who reported him missing. Blood was found in Mark's residence. Everything pointed to Mark Redwine. Again, there were no other suspects. Perhaps by saying, we are all suspects, Mark was trying to spread out the responsibility. He was trying to project his own bad behavior onto everybody, trying to drag them down as well. He couldn't do anything to elevate his position, but he could do something to bring everyone else down. The next question, what was going on with those photographs, the ones that appeared to catch Mark in a compromising situation? Mark, of course, was free to do whatever he wanted as far as apparel choices and dining preferences, but I wonder why he chose to take the photographs. Was this such a special event that he wanted to relive it over and over? Sometimes there's a fine line between taking a picture for entertainment value and creating evidence that will be used against you later on. Sometimes there is no line at all. They can fulfill both functions simultaneously. I don't know if there's really an upside to memorializing that particular diaper-related incident, but if he wanted to do that, he should not have put those images on a computer that his sons could access. The behavior exhibited in the photographs is consistent with a condition called coprophagia, but of course I don't know if Mark has that condition. If he did have this condition, could it have contributed to homicidal behavior? Coprophagia is associated with many other disorders and conditions, including dementia, autism spectrum disorder, schizophrenia, obsessive compulsive disorder, cognitive impairment, lingering, epilepsy, personality disorders, alcohol use, aggression, hypersexuality, depression, and coprophilia. When coprophagia occurs in people who have coprophilia, it's usually associated with an effort to enhance masturbation or other sexual experiences. It has a strong association with feelings of disgust and shame, and it can become chronic and disruptive. The condition does not have an association with homicidal behavior, but it is a condition that typically warrants treatment by a mental health professional. Moving to the next question, what went wrong in this relationship between Mark and Dylan? Was this really a fight over the embarrassing photographs? Is that really enough of a motive for murder? We don't have a lot of information about Dylan's personality or behavior. We know that he wasn't happy about spending time with his father, and we know he requested those embarrassing images in order to confront Mark. If Mark was really that humiliated due to the images, why didn't he just avoid spending time with Dylan? It would have been easy. After all, Dylan didn't want to visit him. It's possible that Mark was just using the visits with Dylan to get back at Elaine. So he was torn. He was ambivalent. He was embarrassed about the images, but he didn't want to give up his chance to hurt his ex-wife. What do I think happened in this case? 
I think that on the evening of November 18, 2012, Mark and Dylan engaged in an argument in Mark's living room. Mark struck Dylan with an object and killed him, perhaps some type of metal tool. Mark disposed of the body in a place that was familiar to him and his skull not far away, hoping no one would ever find the remains. He relied on those alternate theories of the crime to avoid suspicion. Namely, Dylan was known to hang out in different places around the area. Maybe an animal attacked him. Maybe a stranger took him. He could have run away. I don't think Mark planned the murder. It was probably a heat-of-the-moment situation. It appears as though a number of factors contributed to the homicide. Mark was impulsive, violent, and self-centered. His shame about the photographs was only making him more dangerous, more desperate to escape the pain of humiliation. Mark's relationship with his son was failing. His behavior had driven Dylan away. Dylan didn't want anything to do with him. Mark, of course, was not seeing Elaine anymore, and he was not seeing Corey because Corey was over 18 and didn't have to visit him. Dylan was his last connection to his former family. Mark acted out of rage in a way that would punish Dylan for not liking him and punish Elaine for not being with him. Killing Dylan could have been Mark's path to revenge. Those are my thoughts on the case of Mark Redwine. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.